take the time to introduce Catherine Milkman. She is the James G. Campbell Assistant Professor of Operations and Information Management at Wharton. Her research relies heavily on big data to document various ways in which individuals system systematically deviate from making optimal choices, like under saving for retirement or exercising too little and eating too much junk food, and to explore how to reduce the incidence of such decision errors. Professor Milkman has published nearly two dozen articles in leading social science journals, and she has worked with numerous companies on research, including Google and the American Red Cross. In addition, her research has been featured by media outlets such as The New Yorker, The New York Times, Business Week, The Financial Times, and NPR. In 2011, Professor Milkman was recognized as one of the top 40 business school professors under 40 by Poets and Quants. And in 2013, she was voted Wharton's Iron Prof by the school's MBA students. Professor Milkman received her undergraduate degree from Princeton University, boo, summa cum laude, and her PhD from Harvard, boo. Please join me in welcoming to the, to the stage Professor Katie Milkman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Not sure, okay, great. I'm echoing, perfect, so that means you can hear me. Um, so today I'm gonna tell you about some of my ideas on what you'll learn about business at Wharton. That's my interpretation or twist on what is business. And I wanna start by telling you about an idea for helping people like Liz Lemon, the lead character on NBC's former hit show, 30 Rock. In case you aren't familiar with Liz Lemon's persona, let me give you a quick profile. Liz is a 30-something exec who works too much exercises too little, and is generally a disaster when it comes to self-control. I'd like to make two plausible assumptions about Liz. First, assume Liz wishes she exercised more but lacks the willpower. And second, assume she has a thing for trashy novels but feels guilty wasting her time reading junk. I'm gonna tell you about a solution to both of these problems that I call temptation bundling. The idea is simple. What if Liz only allowed herself to read trashy novels while exercising at the gym. She'd stop wasting time at home on literary garbage and start craving trips to the gym to find out what happens next in her latest thriller. Not only that, but she'll enjoy her workout and her novel more combined. She won't feel guilty reading the novel, and time will fly at the gym. Now, as important as it is to increase exercise and reduce wasted time, temptation bundling isn't just a way to solve these two particular problems. It can solve many others as well. For instance, imagine you're trying to watch your waistline, but you also crave hamburgers from your favorite burger restaurant. And imagine you have a crazy Aunt Tilly who you should spend more time with. What if you only allowed yourself to go to your favorite burger restaurant with Aunt Tilly? You'd eat fewer burgers when you should be dieting, and you'd see more of that crazy Aunt Tilly. Or for those of you who've discovered the joys of the spa, imagine only allowing yourself to get a pedicure when catching up on overdue reading for class, or to watch your favorite TV show while catching up on laundry, or to pick up that mocha frappuccino you so crave when heading to the library to hit the books. These are all examples of temptation bundling, solving multiple problems at once. So an important question then is, does it work? And in my research, I ran an experiment to find out. I looked to see whether or not people would exercise more if they were only able to access tempting audio novels when they were at the gym. And indeed, I found that this increased exercise significantly over the course of a seven-week study. And not only that, at the end of my study, I asked participants, would you like to pay me for the service of taking away your iPod, which is preloaded with audio novels that you could otherwise use freely and locking it at the gym in a monitored locker? And 65% said, that would be great. Please take away my iPod so I can only use it when I'm exercising. All right, so this suggests that there might be demand for a company like Netflix, let's call it Gymflix, that lets you set aside certain TV shows for gym-only access, or for apps that let you set aside certain, certain components of your phone that you can only use at some geolocations, like at Aunt Tilly's or when you're at the gym. All right, so this is my first answer to the question, what will you learn about business at Wharton? You'll learn about insights that might spark entrepreneurial ideas. So the insight here, and an insight that I cover in my class, is that people have serious self-control problems. And not only that, but they actually, they're aware of their self-control problems, and they're willing to pay for opportunities that will help them bind their hands and avoid falling victim to those self-control problems. So let me tell you about a couple other quick ideas that came out of business school classes and, uh, and that are based on the same principle. One idea has been applied at Green Bank, which is a bank in the Philippines. They came up with a new savings product based on this insight. 
And what that savings product did is it offered you the opportunity to set a predetermined date or a predetermined savings goal before which you could not withdraw money from your savings account. And this particular savings product, though it had exactly the same interest rate as an, another account that was available where you can withdraw your money freely, was actually quite popular. About 30% of people preferred this restricted savings account that would help them avoid giving into the temptation to withdraw money before they'd reached a goal or preset date. And just having access to this actually increased savings in the population studied by 81%. Another entrepreneurial idea that came out of a business school class where people learned about self-control problems is a website called stick.com. At stick.com, you can set a goal for something you want to achieve, like, say, lose a little bit of weight. Say you want to lose five pounds in the next month. And then you can set stakes. You put money on the line that you'll forfeit if you fail to achieve your goal. And finally, you choose a referee someone who will actually report back to the site on whether or not you successfully achieved your goal by the predetermined date. And guess what? If you fail to achieve your goal by that date, your money will be forfeit. It'll be sent to a charitable organization of your choice, and that's a good way to help yourself stick to those goals. All right, so the first answer to the question I already gave you, the second answer I want to give you is, what you, um, is that you'll learn about ideas pertinent to managing and influencing others. And this is another topic that I cover in my class that I want to give you a brick, uh, quick preview of. So one idea or framework that I talk about is the idea that um, everywhere choices are made, there are choice architects influencing them. What exactly do I mean by choice architecture? Well, this is a picture of a cafeteria. If you think about a cafeteria, someone has set up that environment, and the environment is going to shape your choices. The person who set up that environment is a choice architect, whether they know it or not. And what do I mean by that? Well, think about going up to the cafeteria line with your tray. Something comes first in the line. Something comes last. And where those things appear in line is actually going to dramatically influence the likelihood they end up on your tray. The first thing you encounter, much more likely to end up on your empty tray than the last thing you run into when your tray is already packed full of stuff. And so whoever decided what would come first and what would come last, they're a choice architect. Because something has to come first and something has to come last, I would argue that we should be wise choice architects and try to lay out choice environments so that they help people make good decisions. So why not put the healthy food, for instance, at the beginning of the line? Try to encourage people to take a little bit more of that. So let me give you a couple other ideas that will help you understand what I mean by good choice architecture. So this is a picture of a urinal from the men's restroom in Stockholm, Sweden's airport. And in that particular men's restroom, they were having a problem with spillage. So people were getting off flights, maybe they were a little bit tired like you guys this morning, and they weren't aiming very effectively. And so someone, a wise choice architect, came up with a really good idea for solving this problem. What they did was really simple. They etched a little fly into the urinal, which gave people something to aim at, and this actually, in a careful study, reduced spillage by 40%. <laughs> All right, here's another example of good choice architecture. This is an aerial view of Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, Illinois. And as you can see right here, the cars are coming up on a pretty dangerous curve that they tend to take a little too fast. And a wise choice architect came up with a great idea here. The choice architect etched lines into the pavement, those white lines that you can see, that actually get closer and closer together as you approach the curve. So if you're driving along Lakeshore Drive, you get this sensation that you're speeding up because the lines come faster and faster and faster as you approach the curve. And that leads people to have the automatic reaction to put their foot on the brake and try to slow down. All right, I want to show you one last example of good choice architecture just to make sure you understand what I'm talking about.
right, now that you understand what good choice architecture looks like, you'll also be able to recognize bad choice architecture, which you want to shy away from. So in my class, I teach students about principles that good choice architects can use. And one of those principles, just to give you a preview, is to set wise defaults. What is a default? A default is the option you'll end up with if you don't opt out, if you don't actively choose not to end up with that choice. And why are defaults sticky? Well, first, we're kind of lazy. We're, we're, we show a lot of inertia in our choices. And second, we actually tend to think of the default as this must be recommended. If Wharton defaulted me into this, it must not be such a crazy thing, right? They're incredibly powerful, though, and this is always surprising to people. So this is a graph uh, that came out about a decade ago in the journal Science that shows the difference across European countries in organ donation or organ donor opt-in in the rate of organ donors as a function of whether or not the country makes organ donation the default. So do you have to opt in by filling out a simple form, which is, by the way, what we have in the United States. You, you just sort of check a box when you are at the, at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Or do you opt out and just fill out a simple form to say, I don't want to be an organ donor? This really trivial piece of choice architecture, you might think, has an enormous effect on this really important decision. We see about an 80% effect of making organ donation the default. So a principle of good choice architecture is to set defaults wisely. And with that, I'll leave you with these insights. What you'll learn about business at Warden are insights that spark entrepreneurial ideas and frameworks pertinent to managing and influencing others, and many, many other exciting things. I hope you enjoy your visit, and I hope to see you in my class in the coming years. Thank you. management at Wharton.